This is 3Q, I'm Sarah MacDonald. There was a time when you had a job for life, with security, entitlements, even the occasional pay rise. But now Australia has the most casualised workforce in the OECD after Spain. 40% of us are casual or on contract. So do Australians want a secure job? ACTU President Jed Carney is with me. I didn't know it was such a big proportion mm. of the workforce. How did we get to this stage? Well, it's been a very gradual rise, I guess, to 40% of the workforce. It's happened pretty much over the last 25, 30 years, uh, where there has been, uh, I think, if you look at what academics are saying about this, like John Buchanan and others, it's about a deliberate shift of the risk of employing people, of being employers, away from the state, away from the employer and onto the individual. Um, it's happening in lots of areas really in, uh, in, a, in a, you know, a market fundamentalist world, I guess you could say. So uh, we're seeing more and more that people are taking the risk of being sick um, on themselves because if you're employed casually, you don't get sick pay, of course. Uh, they take the risk of getting injured, of um, not getting training. They have to pay for their own training. So a lot of the costs associated with employing people have actually been shifted onto the individual. And this, of course, maximises profits and uh, doesn't really distribute wealth evenly. The belief is though that it really helps a lot of young people who like to move around and change jobs, especially the young today, and also women who are coming back into the workforce, that it suits them because it gives them flexibility. Are, mm. they, are they getting flexibility? Ah, well, you see, what we're hearing is that flexibility is the panacea for workers, but it's just not the case. Um, we're having an inquiry at the moment uh, where we are actually hearing from people who are employed in these types of employment contracts. And what they're telling us is they have very little flexibility at all because all the flexibility is for the employer. So people are working 70 hours a week, for example, just in case they don't get a shift next week or uh, they go to work sick. Uh, because they fear that if they don't go to work they may not get offered a shift next week or you know it might actually penalise them somehow. So even though people do want flexibility it's just not playing out for the employee. Uh, we're not saying it doesn't work for some people, you know, young people with part-time jobs at university, that sort of thing um, is fine and there's certainly a place for casuals in, in a workforce to absorb peaks and troughs but 40% of the workforce in these types of employment is, is really unreasonable, we think. You, you mentioned the inquiry that you've set up. This is chaired by the former Deputy Prime Minister, Brian Howe. Tell us the, the idea behind the inquiry. Well, um, late last year, the ACTU did a major survey of all our members. About 42,000 union members answered a survey. And uh, one of the major issues that came out of that survey was that this was causing people anxiety, being employed in, in um, short-term contracts, in labour hire, in casual jobs, uh, creating a great deal of um, insecurity for them and their families. So uh, we thought we'd delve a little bit deeper into this and when we started to do some research. And uh, it did play out in the research, this is how our workforce is going. So we thought, well, let's hear from people really because the only voice we hear in this um, debate has been employers who say they need flexibility, they need to be la to lay people off in hard times, you know, that it's, it's all about their needs. So let's just have a listen to how it actually impacts on individuals' lives and people. And so uh, we launched the inquiry. Um, Brian Howe was very kind to offer to chair it. And uh, we're hearing some incredible stories out of that inquiry that really I think will change the way that people view this type of employment contract. Yeah, he's, he's expressed a lot of surprise about how things have changed since he was uh, the, the Deputy Premier. Yes, yes. He, he, he uses the term that in the post-war years, um, all the debate was about security. Um, now it, it's all the opposite. It's all about insecurity. Mm. Mm. Let, let's have a, a look at some of the things that the inquiry is hearing, some of the stories that are coming up. Well, it's too hard to manage your life on a casual wage, and just not knowing what you'll get paid from one week to the next. Yeah, my boyfriend and I want to get married and have kids, but, you know, I need a job I can rely on. I've been looking for something else, but there are just so few permanent jobs around. Everyone I know is in exactly the same boat, and it just makes it so hard to plan for the future. All workers deserve the same rights, entitlements and certainty as their permanent colleagues doing the same job. Join the campaign at www.securejobs.org.au. Jed, do you think that people want a secure job? Is that what you're hearing? 
Uh, what we're hearing is that people want security. Now we know that times have changed and you don't stay in one job for 40 years anymore like you know my parents generation did and you get the gold watch when you retire. Uh, people will change jobs but what people want is security. They want to know that if they get sick that they have some paid sick leave. If they need to stay home for their kids or their elderly mothers uh, they'd like to know that they could get some paid leave. Two million Australians do not get paid holidays anymore in this country. Uh, they'd like to know that they can get access to training, that they can have a career. The young ones, I think it's a big furphy about young ones saying that they want the flexibility because they're the ones that are telling us more than any other demographic that they'd really like to be able to advance a career and they can't do that in this type of work. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean a permanent job, it means lots of safeguards that actually build security for people around their working life. All right, let's open this up to our, to our panel. Peter, what impact does a casualised workforce have on, on planning and, and building in our cities? Well, casualisation can be a big positive if people have more control over their lives and then they, they can manage that work-lifestyle balance. Uh, but it shows that the, the, the planning system is even more crucial there because they have to get around. You need a transport system which can take people from their home to the job, to the school, the childcare centre, the, the hospital. Uh, and that's the problem at the moment. The, the economy and the workforce is restructuring, but the planning system, the way we design our cities, isn't keeping up. So it's not keeping up with the more, possibly more flexible workplace or the Jeb May argument or the casual work and the different hours that people are doing. Yeah, it's, it's still being designed for a workforce that's uh, a model that's 30 years old. Nine to five. Actually, you know, Peter raises a really good point because we had uh, a young teacher give evidence to the inquiry who said that she had a, um, could only get casual teaching work uh, and they would post her, they'd ring her up at seven o'clock in the morning and say, you've got to be over at Blacktown or whatever. Um, and she didn't have a car but she couldn't get a loan for a car because she didn't have a permanent job. So she could not, you know, the bank wouldn't give her a loan. So she didn't have public transport, so she had to give up shifts. So then her income drops. So it is a vicious cycle. You raise a really good point, actually. Mm. And Melina, what, what, what would you like to contribute to this? So what about cooperatives? Do they hire casuals or full-timers? How, how does it work in cooperatives? Well, they're a business like any other, so they're looking at productivity and they, and they manage their workforce according to the, the right number of employees to do the job. But there is a significant difference. One, in the cooperative movement, there is a social justice um, incentive. It, it, it isn't for no reason that the International Labour Organisation has, uh, has singled out cooperative businesses as the only form of, of business structure that can actually support a fair work agenda Similarly, the United Nations has, has said that um, cooperative businesses support socio and economic development globally and the cooperative business model is the only time that an international year has had a business structure uh, given that uh, awarded, to, uh, awarded to an international year. Um, I would say that in cooperatives, because they're people-centred, they are able to distribute their profits across all of their stakeholders and of course employees are an important part of, the, of their stakeholder mm. community and, in, and indeed in many cooperatives employees are also members and owners of that business so they're going to be in a more uh, supportive environment in and terms secure? of... Uh, you, and, 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 and secure? Are they feeling more secure? Certainly, feel? certainly. Yeah. I mean if we look at... Uh, I have to bring in the bank example here. If, if we just look at what's happened with ANZ in the last week their ANZ is diligently uh, driving up profits, fulfilling its legal obligation to, to its shareholders to maximise profits and return on their equity. Um, really the only way that it can drive up profits continually is to do two things, that's to screw down its labour costs and raise prices. In a cooperative business it's still maximising its profits but it's doing so for its owner members which may very well be their employees as well. So it's driving down those profits back into secure jobs. And, and Jeb, what, do you, what are other concrete things we can do to provide some flexibility in the workforce but a secure job that Australians want? I think we have to look at what people actually classify a secure job and try to provide those. We've had labour hire firms, for example, come to us and say, well, there's no reason that we can't give some of our casual workers paid leave. Uh, so let's start talking with businesses about how we can secure people's lives around these business models. Um, looking at having clauses in enterprise agreements, it might mean changing legislation to say that we can actually bargain around job security issues like that. So there's a range of things from legislation through to bargaining, uh, through to just uh, society actually providing some security. It might be uh, something like uh, income security that is provided by the state. So 
you know, there's lots of things that we could do. Mm -hmm. All right, well, you're on uh, 3Q, and if you'd like to contribute to this conversation in any way, we'd love you to jump on to the Essential Vision website, or you can use 3Q hashtag on Twitter. This is 3Q.